everybody. Welcome back. I'm going to load up two videos today. And one of them is on beating the bot. The, the algorithms that we uh, have to go through to get a job. And the surprises I found out about it. In that video, I talk a lot about creativity. And the companies that are looking for creativity. And I talk about the creativity that was stifled when we went to work. After everybody said that we were going to be creative. We need your creativity. And we find out that it's, it's not wanted. But in the course of doing our careers, we have literally forgotten how to be creative. You know, you go to work, you're 10, 12, 14 hours a day. It doesn't leave a lot of time to have fun and to express ourselves. And some people have hobbies, you know, some people are very active, they go hiking, you know, they go out into the wilderness, they, re they rejuvenate by walking, jogging, going out with friends. I'm talking about that spark of creativity, that thing that helps us design and create. You know, I dealt with engineers and when there was a downturn, I would have all these young engineers come to me and say, well, we don't know what to do. We're oil and gas engineers. You're engineers. Build something. Find a problem and solve it. Create it. Do something, right? But because of, of the type of work that they had done, the type of schooling they had done, I think that, that's al that was already started to push down. In fact, I know that a lot of our creativity was pushed down pretty much starting in grade one. I found in kindergarten people wanted you just to be, but as you started to get older into grade one and you went to art class and they said draw a tree and and you know all about trees, you'd climb them, you'd sat under them, you'd seen them, you'd talk to your friends and your family about them and you do this amazing tree and they said, ooh, that doesn't look like a tree. You have to change. If you want marks in this class, you have to draw a tree a certain way. It has to have green top, brown bottom, apples. That's a tree. So we learned at a very young age to put away our creativity. And a number of years ago, and it was a number of years ago, um, I owned a restaurant that was working 100 hours a week. And a friend of mine for Christmas, our only day off a year, gave Christmas presents to all of her friends. And what she gave was a sketchbook, pack of crayons, and some watercolors. And said we had to go create a picture however that picture looked and we have to have a frame and we had to put it in our house I thought the woman was mad. I thought she was absolutely nuts I don't have time for this I'm serious I've got things to do and I want to thank Lou because Lou it was one of the best gifts I have ever received I've had a lot of comments about the art that's behind me and the pictures keep changing. This is my sister Joan's art. Fabulous. It came from that gift. Because Joan doesn't draw rocks and trees like other people draw rocks and trees. So she was never considered an artist. She was never considered good. One of her inspirations as a child, before she even knew what art was, was a Canadian Ojibwe artist by the name of Norvell Morisot. And if you ever see Norvell Morisot's work, it is staggering. This is a man that had so much art in his soul that when he had nothing, he was taking boards and house paint to paint because he had to paint. He had to express his art. And his art was very bold colors that were outlined. And my sister at the ripe old age of seven saw this man and said, oh my God, 
that's art? When everybody around them was saying, what the hell is that? Doesn't look like anything. No, it doesn't. It was spirit paintings from a man that was pulling from inside himself. So Joan learned very soon not to talk about art, not to be creative. And then she got this gift, this gift of expression, this gift of go express yourself. And it doesn't matter. We're not talking about Picasso unless you're the Picasso. So she started to paint. And boy, she started to paint. She's painted for years. And I have paint. There's paint up here on the walls. There's paint here. You've seen paintings. And she also expresses herself through food. Joan is an amazing chef. She's an actual Red Seal chef, but she is an amazing chef. One of the stories that I tell on her is my sister cannot eat cheese. When she eats cheese, all she tastes is sour milk. It doesn't matter if it's a soft cheese or a blue cheese or an aged cheese or a young cheese. It doesn't matter. There is no flavor other than sour milk when she tastes it. So when we're catering and people say, I want a cheese tray, my sister goes out to the store and smells things. She literally smells the cheese. She puts it together by smell. And people always say, oh my God, it's the best cheese. I never would have put those together. They think she's marvelous. She can't taste cheese. Doesn't mean she can't express herself in cheese. I express myself in wool. I knit things. Socks are new for me. I would knit an entire Aran sweater, but I was terrified to knit a sock. I thought it was complicated. From the knitting world, it's actually quite easy. If you never knit a sock before, you'd think it was quite hard. But after all, you just simply learn. You practice. You practice being creative. I would never have used this type of combination of color because it came, this, this wool came to me in a gift basket. It was just one of those things where you order something and they threw in a couple of balls of wool. Sock wool. So I thought, oh, fine, I will do socks. And the pleasure of making a sock and giving to somebody, and let me assure you, if you have ever worn a hand knit sock, you will never again buy one. They're stunning. They're absolutely stunning. And I started to knit socks. Something new. Okay, here's the one that's right under my edge. This, my neighbor gave me. He gave me a block of wood for Christmas. And then I drew out a whole bunch of spoons and he cut them out for me because I am bound and determined I'm gonna carve spoons. Now you can go to the store and buy spoons. Most people would, but there's something fascinating and I think I get this from my father. My father's a great woodworker, but he didn't pass that on to the girls. So I've decided I'm going to make wooden spoons. I'll show them to you when they're done. It may be kindling. But you got to dare. And because our creativity has been pushed down, it's scary. Most people stare at blank pages. And I, I don't care if you're a writer, a painter, a knitter, a carver, stained glass, anything. <clears throat> we have to awaken this inside us because we were the ones that worked. We worked all the time. And now we're being asked to be creative. We want you to be creative. Well, no wonder we fail those bots. We've learned it over the course of many years. Creativity isn't what these companies want. And they don't thank you for it because it, it's very hard to, to manage a creative person. A creative person is very hard to manage. They're enthusiastic. They're coming up with all these ideas. They expect these ideas to be acted upon, which you think they would be. Um, but the, the companies themselves can't absorb that idea. 
They ask for them all the time, but I don't think they really know what to do with them. And I worked with a lot of engineers. And I thought engineers would be the most creative people I would ever work with. I mean, fundamentally, if you want anything built, you have to have an engineer help you with it. There's a bridge that goes over the, the Saskatchewan River in Saskatoon. And it's known for the openings in the bridge um, that the railing sits on. Sorry, no words today. And when it was drawn, the fellow drew it and it was beautiful, stunning. The wife came along, looked at that and said, are you kidding me? You'd lose children through that. Can't have that. So what he did was he took his daughter's head and he put it in a, a, a door. <laughs> and he closed the door until she couldn't get her head out. And then he measured that part. I don't know if the daughter appreciated it. The wife certainly didn't. And he drew, he redrew the design to incorporate the safety measures of not having the children run through the, these openings. Because he figured anything past the toddler, he was good on. That's creativity. <laughs> we didn't build things utilitarian. They were always decorating. And the decorations came from the engineer, came from the people doing the work. And I think we've lost it. I think we've lost a lot of that. But we have this incredible opportunity. We're being laid off at such a huge amount. And it really is this, this age group that we have to get back to it. We have to go ahead and, and be creative. And finger paints, I keep shouting these things out because it doesn't matter. It's up to you. You will evolve in your creativity. You'll become a sculptor. You'll build fences. You'll, you'll do whatever it is that sparks that joy inside you. There are a few people I follow on YouTube. Now, I follow them, and I follow them because they, they are my interests, right? I don't expect you to follow them. I expect you to learn from them. Go look at them. Listen to what they have to say. So one of them is a woman by the name of Catherine, or Kath, Kathy Hay. H-A-Y. Kathy Hay lives a, not a different lifestyle, but she... She expresses herself differently. She wears period costumes. Now, they have been modernized, but they are definitely not what you would see in Vogue, unless Vogue's following Kathy Hay. And this is an entire community of people who literally sew in front of the window with a needle and thread. Because it's not just good enough to sew or to wear period costume. They physically make it out of as close to the materials as possible using the same technique. And part of that is a history lesson. How did people do this? One of the dresses that she's making at this moment is called the peacock dress. And this peacock dress is international. It was worn in India by the um, British representative when royalty came to visit. It is the most astounding piece of Indian craft that it, 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 it's magnificent. This dress was entirely covered in beads to make it look like a peacock feathers from top to bottom. It's staggering. They have the dress, but the dress was not stored correctly, so it has tarnished. Kathy Hay is in the process of recreating the original. She's gone, she's, I shouldn't say gone. She has met people who are going to help her navigate through the, the society, the, the stores of India to get this work done. And she's doing it with an ethical and a moral bent to it. 
because at the time it was made, it was not so. Some of it hasn't changed. Women were paid less than men. Um, that's always been the case. Of course, going to India, the workmanship would be pennies, but depending on the economy, that's what it was. But she's in the process of recreating this and showing everybody what this work was and giving credit where credit is due. But she also has a sideline, and that sideline is helping you to find yourself, find yourself through creativity. The grocery girls of Edmonton are an absolute scream. <clears throat> They're called the grocery girls because their parents own a grocery store. Their husbands work at a grocery store. And they are knitting fiends. And they started this blog a few years ago just to do it. Just to do it. We're on the internet now. We're just going to do it. And they're hilarious. It, it's about knitting and other things. Well, they have tapped in to this international circle of creative people. Wool. Dyeing wool. Spinning wool. Selling wool wherever. And they put together this community that now listens to them. So from there, I have found another one called La Bien Amie. Sorry for the French. A uh, girl from Kansas gets married uh, to a Frenchman. They move to France. Over the course of the first few years that she's there, she decides she needs to knit. She's had some family issues, so she's going to knit them out. She does. And over the course of this knitting, things start coming into her mind. How am I going to do this? What am I going to do? And she said the perfect thing she wanted to do was open up a cafe and have people come knit and I'll sell wool. And if you know anything about knitters, wherever we go, we buy wool. And we bring it home. And, and it's called a stash. Anybody who's attached to a knitter, be it a man or a woman, by the way, men knit, you know all about this stash. It's our prized possessions. It gives us joy. It's something we're going to do with this wool. So she starts this off. So she, sell, she buys a restaurant. She goes for a walk. She finds a perfect restaurant. She buys the restaurant. She has never owned a restaurant. She has never worked in a restaurant. She certainly hasn't done one in Paris. And she has a little wall of wool. The owner take pity on her. They teach her about the restaurant business over the few months. She starts this business. This was done, I believe, in about 2006. And then she decides she's going to dye wool. The grocery girls and this lady have connected. She is now dyeing wool specifically for them or in, in inspiration by them. And on March 26th, La Bien Ami is having a knitting circle for hundreds around the world, take place in France. And it came out of a love of knitting. It came out of a love of expressing yourself. When you knit something, when you sew something, when you carve a spoon and give it away, there's something to it. It comes from your hand and your heart to that person. It's, a, it's, it's just beautiful. It's so creative. It is so what we need now. You know, we may not be able to go back to work the way we are or where we did. For some of us, that's going to be a hardship. Some people were not prepared to be laid off at this time of life or any time of life. Some people are more fortunate. They can take other jobs, jobs that don't pay as much, but give them joy. What I want everybody to tap into is that thing inside that you've always wanted to do. Another one I follow is called The Little Homestead. It's, a, it's about a, a family that moved out to a desert. And I'm not even sure where this desert is. What I like about this family is they are fearless. They will try anything. They will fail. And it's okay. But they're more successful than they are failures. I, I mean, honest to God, they, they've got a whole way of 
building earth bags and they've covered floor with, with paper bags and they've made underground heating out of clay ovens and they've started aquaponics and it's staggering. They will try and do anything. It is so refreshing. It's so, it, it's so uplifting. And they have a scream doing it. They have fun. Lou gave me a gift. So, I'm going to give a couple of people a gift as well. I'm supposed to say, subscribe, like, pass on. And for the next week, I'm going to watch my subscriptions. And I understand there is a way of getting the name of the person who subscribes or their email, something. If that doesn't work, I'll come back to you and ask you to send me emails <laughs> on my Facebook privately. But I'm going to give a sketchbook. I'm passing it along, Lou. Some pencil crayons. And some paint and I'm going to invite these people to come on a journey and you know what just do it just go out there buy yourself a scrapbook go to the dollar store don't spend a lot of money go to Amazon if you can't get out buy some crayons buy some pens and write and paint pick up some knitting needles don't do it because you have to be good at it. Good will come later. And people who follow other people's examples, this is how we paint a tree. You can do that for technique. But more than anything, this is about what's here. If your tree is this tall, purple, with green spots, and there's a wind blowing through it, fabulous. It's your tree hanging on the wall. There is a fellow, let me see if I can remember the name, and he started painting um, pictures of animals. Rubbish pictures of animals, and I believe that's the name of the article. I will find it and I will link it. And he was teaching his son. He was trying to get him involved in some art, so he, he painted this thing. And he gave himself a pseudonym, and he put it on Facebook, I think. He got requests for these rubbish paintings. Can you please do my cat? Can you please do my dog? So he said, I can't take money for this. People want to pay him. So I think he put 299 pounds on it. And he's given it to charity. Well, this charity is like the amount of money this man's spending. So he's taken what he considers rubbish and they are charming. There is something about these animal portraits. I'm thinking this, this is marvelous. I'll have one of my dog done. Absolutely. Because he, he captures the essence in these ridiculous paintings or little sketches and, and, He's calling them rubbish, but they're charming and, and they give pleasure and they raise money for charity. Because he, he was creative. So I'm gonna double dog dare you. How's that? And I'm going to double dog dare you that you draw a picture in the week. Write a poem. Stack some rocks. Whatever it is. Do something for you and go past the fear. A lot of people look at the blank page and say, I can't do it because it has to be perfect. No, it doesn't. It wasn't perfect when you were a child. It does not have to be perfect now. And we have to get that out of our heads. We do not have to be perfect. We have to be joyous. We have to express ourselves because we haven't for so long. So just do it, just do it.
and feel free to send it to me. No critique. No critique. Just send it to me. It's just joyous. That's what it is. It's joyous. So I'm going to find out how I'm going to give two sets away as my first giveaway off YouTube. And I want everyone to have a joyous week and to find themselves and to be creative. And next week, I'll see you again. I'm Jean.